Well, I'm here with Davey. Hi, Davey. Hey, Al. And Anna. Hey, Al. And Jerome Rothenberg. Jerry, hi. I'm so, <laughs> so honored and happy that you're here. We're going to be talking about two paragraphs from a preface or preface, uh, a part of something that Jerry wrote uh, to contribute to a conference on ethnopoetics. So there's so much we could say about the whole piece, but we're going to focus on these two, these two paragraph length sections. We'll ask Jerry to read it and then we'll talk about it. Jerry? Before I am anything else, I am a poet and living in a time I do, a stand-up performer of my own poetry. It is better for me to do poetry than to talk about it. I do it first and then I sound it. This is doing it a second time, a third, a fourth, a fifth time, to renew it by the sounding. My performance is this sounding of a poem. It is renewal of the poem, the poem's enlivening. Poetry becomes the sounding, not the script apart, the preparation or notation, but the sounding. Where there is no writing, the sounding truly renews the poem, creates it in each instance, for here there is no poem without performance. Writing, that, that strange aid to memory, eventually becomes its surrogate, displaces memory itself, the first great muse. I'm going to ask Jerry to answer this question second, but David, I want to throw it to you <laughs> first. What do you take to be the distinction that Jerry is making in the beginning of this passage that it is better, and he says, for me, he's not making a generalization, and I think he might, actually, for others, too. It's better for me to do poetry than to talk about it. What's that distinction mean to you? I understand that distinction to be related to an untranslatability of poetry, that the best way to understand poetry uh, in these couple of paragraphs is to engage with it in different ways, is to read the poem, is to write the poem, is to hear the poem aloud, and that's a better and more complete interpretive method than to... Uh, more complete because, sorry to interrupt. More, more complete, complete because, because it's multimodal, because, it's, uh, because a poem is both uh, a spoken event and a silently read event, and trying to interpret it without those two modes of access uh, means changing it into something that it's not. Jerry, you, use, you, can, you can answer that question in any way you like, of course, but I want to add to it this phrase, stand-up performer. It's <laughs> such a loaded phrase because the word, the, the uh, compound adjective stand-up is usually referring to comedians and mm -hmm. sticky people and vaudevillians. Well, so you have course. a little of that in you. <laughs> So what, what do you, what's your take on this distinction? Uh, well, of, co of course, there is a play on the, uh, the stand-up comic and, uh, you know, the sense that for most of us, uh, the performance came in the course of the poetry reading. Uh, so, uh, typically, there's a text, one has the text, one reads from it, you know, and one does whatever one wants to do or what, whatever one is capable of doing. Uh, in, in, in the reading. Uh, and, uh, and what's radical here is you're reversing that process a little bit by saying that the sounding of a poem is originary in some cases. Well, it, it changes for me, you know, in each reading. You know, but sometimes it's just minimal changes from one reading to another. But I, I was writing this also, I think, in the context of what uh, David Anton was starting to do at that time, <clears throat> the so-called talk poems, uh, in which he gets up, stands up in front of an audience, you know, no doesn't script. read, but talks. Yeah. But then, interestingly, I've always felt, the end product is a writing. For Anton. For Anton. In other words, he, he doesn't let it go at the talking, uh, which if you listen back to recordings of a talking performance, uh, it sounds like a man talking. When he comes to transcribe it, you know, and then compose it into a talk poem, uh, he does it with uh, jagged margins. There's no justification of it as prose. Uh, spaces internally, 
uh, you know, that indicate silences or, you know, very minute silences, you know, as I'm being silent now <laughs> between uh, phrases, you know, and, uh, you know, and other typographical effects so that when you look at it, you know, it is no longer a page of prose. It is something else, you know, and to David, and, you know, and to me also, that something else, you know, is a form of, uh, of, of poetry. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of yeah. versification or lineation or, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. you know, whereas for me and most of us, uh, the performance comes after the writing of the poem. So writing first, performance later. I want to ask David, you... performance first, writing right, later. Right, right. He almost never goes back to reading what he has written. Right. You know, I, I think on one or two occasions, uh, you know, locally in San Diego, you know, I have gotten him to, you know, to read from a talk poem. Yeah, from the text. Yeah, but yeah. That's, uh, that, that's not really what it's about. Uh, I, I'm going to come back to you in a second to ask you about why people might take this and other statements you made at this time as opening up the field, not to put too, too uh, yeah. much pressure on that phrase. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so I want to come back to that because that's really why I think we're talking about this passage, to think about poetry as sounding, as essentially or quasi-essentially a sounding, as Davy was suggesting, makes poetry a larger thing. Um, before we get there, Anna, can you help translate into other English words this <laughs> phrase, poetry becomes the sounding. Poetry becomes the sounding. And then a little later, the poetry sounding becomes the poetry reading. And there, reading is a very thick word. Mm. Because it refers not just to use reading texts with your eyes, but reading as in a performance and reading as in an interpretation. OK, so Anna, take it wherever you want. And then I'm going to turn back to Jerry. Uh, I'm reminded of um, a Mary Baracus poem, How You Sound. Yes. Um, uh, pro statement. Pro statement, for the yeah. New American Poetry yeah, in 1960. Yeah. yeah. Um, reminded of that because it, it um, that I think is a text that is doing some of the work of um, poems on the page are the words in their arrangement, they're the line breaks, they're the stanza breaks, they're those kinds of arrangements, but it's also the actual, like, voiced. Um, process, right, of the of the poet actually speaking, right, the poem, right, which is why I think in Modpo we we place so much you know kind of emphasis on using that pen sound archive and um, inviting readers to consider, and there's still readers when they consider the sound. Yeah. So in that piece, Baraka uh, Jones at the time, right, um, makes. Sound a verb. Mm. How you, how you play, how you project, how you sound, and then Jerry, there's an implication there and here that sounding is also a plumbing, a discovering, a discerning, an identif a, a seeking an identity. So, do you want to go anywhere with this? Uh, poetry becomes the sounding, and then there's that question, Jerry. I threw a lot at you here. There's a question of sounding in its relation to reading, because reading becomes expansive. Well, sounding, plumbing the depths of uh, <clears throat> exploration. Uh, so, uh, obviously, in, in the process of composing, of writing, uh, you know, and we do it by writing most of the time. Uh, you know, but of course, I, I'm, I'm doing this with an awareness of uh, you know, so much of human history, human poetry. Uh, you know, being only sounding, you know, where there is most a, of it, yeah. historically speaking, probably Histori right. Historically this speaking, uh, you know, poetry is uh, an, the art of sounding words, uh, and uh, where there is no writing intervening, it, it's it's all sounding, you know, and remembering, thinking, you know. So it's it's it's, it's in the mind. It's expressed through the voice, uh, and uh, you know also uh, you know the added notion that there is no fixed text. Then, uh, 
the right. uh, you know the, the the old oral performers, uh, you know, were not for the most part memor memorizing a text. Uh, yes, they memorized you know certain catches you know that could be repeated yes. you know in the present performance. Yes, you know, but it was then you know it survived through performance. Performance was the, the vehicle. Yeah. At some point, I want to say something about writing too, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, because there's a lot. Of writing is important. Yeah, there. but we happen to be, and I'm honored always when I see you and I think about this, to be in this room with with someone who is one of two or three people I can think of, who in the post-war period of American and you know international uh, post-war modernism. Uh, is really responsible for widening our sense of the history of poetry as mostly including sounding and as not so moored to permanent textuality, you know. Um, I, wanna, I wanna quote Zara as quoted by you in another piece, another preface, another preface, in some notes toward a poetics of performance written a couple years after the piece that we're discussing here. Uh, I want to quote it, and I want to ask all three of you to react, and this is going to be by way of concluding this short discussion. Uh, so in that piece, you quote Zara as follows, and I want David to go first, and then Jerry, and then Anna. Thought is made in the mouth, Zara. Mm -hmm. So Davy, I know this is of great interest to you. Do you want to riff on this, and then I'll turn to Jerry? Sure. I mean, something that occurs to me in dialogue with that idea that thought is made in the mouth, tying it back to poetry becomes the sounding, is that uh, it um, divorces the idea that there's meaning on the page and what happens when you read a poem aloud is you're animating the meaning in the air, but saying that the sound of making the word, uh, if, we're, if we're saying the word poetry, that those sounds spoken aloud are a fundamentally different thing, a fundamentally different meaning, a fundamentally different texture than the word poetry written on the page, and to understand those as separate, related and in dialogue, but not one is the rehearsal or the uh, transmutation of the other, but is two fundamentally different uh, embodied ways of living with and being with language, mm. uh, which uh, puts a lot of pressure on the body doing the sounding, yeah. um, which is itself super helpful. I want to give Jerry the last word on this, so I'm going to go to Anna next. Um, poet thought is made in the mouth. That's a, that's a, a um, classic Zara overstatement. Uh, made. You think it's mouth. an overstatement? Well, it's fun and over the top, let's just say. Because, mm. because poetry is ma uh, thought is made in the mouth is a way of saying the brain has very little to do with it. Is a bit of an exaggeration, yeah, but and not just poetry, saying thought, basically. thought, right. thought, yeah. So what it just it just reminds me made. Of, I, I, it's made in the mouth. My reading of this is going to be so much simpler than Davy's amazing yeah. alwaysness, but uh, it just reminds me of something I always used to say to my students um, in writing, which is you know, tell me your argument, tell me what you want to write about, tell me like, tell me tell me your paper back to me without having. Without reading speak it. it, speak yeah. it, say speak, it. Like, speak me your paper, speak me your argument. Because um, I really do think that there's um, a lot to be said for this process of like just giving voice to your ideas, mm. you know, mm. in, a, in, a, in a way that is then separate from like what you've written. And might even be closer to, sorry for the phrase, what you mean. Exactly. Might even be closer to who you really are and what you really have to say because writing for young people particularly can be so alienating. You can get yourself really tangled up when you're yeah. so focused on things like yeah. the introductory paragraph and the thesis statement and the like structure of this and that. So sometimes just like speaking, like just tell it back to me. Jerry Rothenberg, you get the last word here. Thought is made in the mouth. Well, it's a loaded statement. It's a very good Tsara statement. Mm. Uh, it doesn't end the question of, uh, you know, of thought or poetry being made in the mouth. Uh, and the, looking back at it, uh, it puts me in mind of, uh, again, of uh, David Anton's talk poems, uh, where David could very well have said, thought is made 
in the mouth. Uh, the process uh, that he thought he shared with the Wittgenstein, uh, you know, of talking to discover. So right. in the process of talking through the mouth, you know, comes the thought. Can I say he shared it with Freud as well, possibly? Possibly. <laughs> that was a, you know, a thing of a, his. A, a talking yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm also put in mind uh, of, uh, I think, way back, uh, Robert Duncan was exploring the notion, you know, that one might summarize as saying, thought is made in the hand. Mm. You know, and uh, uh, Robert was looking at uh, also, you know, manuscripts that are poets who, you know, who created their poems by writing them out through the hand. Right. You know, so the hand then, uh, you know, forget the mouth. The hand becomes the vehicle. And you did the Jerry Rothenberg thing, very sly, of expanding the conversation even further. We thought it was a big conversation, and now it's even bigger because the mouth and the hand, neither of which is the brain, gets us back to writing, which mm. often, I mean, Primo Levi, great writer, mm. and very organized in the way he wrote, he ends his great book, The Periodic Table, with a piece called Carbon, in which it's really the carbon that energizes through enzymes and so forth, the hand that's writing these words, and that's where I am if you want me, again, look for me in this carbon that I'm putting on the page. Mm -hmm. uh, this it's, For him, it's survival. But anyway, I interrupted you. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think it's switched, you know, we're very clear about the notion of the artist's hand. Right. Uh, you know, but uh, Robert said, "Well, let's let's explore possibly the writer's hand or the poet's hand. Yeah. Uh, you know, how how does that work when you're in the process? You know, you're not necessarily talking it, or you yeah. know, or the maybe you know, the little <laughs> in, in, the internal <laughs> conversation talk yeah. going on. You know, but uh, uh, so let, we go from the mouth to the hand, right. and you know, possibly at a certain point, you know, all of these faculties." Right. Large bodily faculties. Are, are, are right. And then bodily faculties. And by quoting Duncan, you're, um, think, you're implying that the hand can do a performance as much as the stand-up mouth performer. That hands perform, mm -hmm. even if it's uh, alone in a garret. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much. Thank you for having done this in 1975, and thanks for spending time now, these many years later, talking with us about it. And Davey and Anna, thank you very much. Thank you.